right, man. Welcome to the introduction for Crow 777 Radio, episode 113. This is really a pretty fantastic episode, and it is a direct result of what went on in the uh, forums over at Crow 777 Radio. This is wholly driven by subscribers and followers and people who contacted us. Today I have with me Alphonse and uh, Jason Lindgren. We're going to take one more run at this law thing, and actually I'm not 100% sure whether we're going to do one more episode on the law or whether we're going to stop here for now and see what's what. So much is laid down here that seems to fit the common sense idea. When I look at a thing, the first thing I try to do is say to myself, is this common sense? Does this make sense? For most of it, it does, but that doesn't make it true. And with all the other things we've laid down recently about the law, you have to vet them. As a matter of fact, one of the main tenets in any court of law you're in is the idea of honor. And in the outline that we do today, we will show flat out that if you walk in with an attorney, it's almost like you're just a baby wearing diapers. You can't even fend for your own self because you don't understand your own rights. If these things are in fact true, there's quite a bit of value in this episode. And uh, Alphonse, who is our guest today is going to provide links in uh, the forum under the episode at Crow 777 Radio. And everyone, everyone has to go out and vet due diligence and understand whether the things said here have merit or they do not. And that's true of anyone interested in the idea of sovereignty. The idea of sovereignty is being an adult human being exercising their God-given rights. And in that is the responsibility of understanding what is correct and what is not. Anyhow, let's jump into episode 113 with Alphonse and Jason. There it is. Cheers. All right, man. Welcome to Crow 777 Radio. This is episode 113, and we are still beating that drum called law. Today, we've actually found an individual. It's just like the average listener, just like Jason, just like me, for that matter, except we are going to lay down some more points of view that have apparently been implemented in the real world. We're going to try to give you names of people you can look up to research this and other places you can go to try to confirm it. I will say once again, Before we get into a show talking about any idea of law, you better damn well know what you're doing in this world if you decide to implement any of the ideas we've expressed in this entire series. With that out of the way, welcome, Jason. Good morning, Crow. How goes it, man? Things going all right with you? Quite well. How about you? Hey, man, I can't complain. The weather is beautiful. Everything is in bloom, and I got my garden planted. But without much further ado, I'd like to get Alphonse in here. Welcome, Alphonse. Good morning, Crown and Jason. Hey, man, thanks for taking the time to come in and do this. I'm hoping we can have a good back and forth between the three of us and use your knowledge base as an average person who has gone at the ideas we've been covering over these past few shows and actually lay down some people that folks can look up, maybe some other places they can go to try to learn more. And uh, without going any further down that road, Jason, I'm going to kick it straight to you. You want to you want to get the ball rolling? Maybe maybe I should uh, maybe I should do one of those uh, 91, 82, 73 hike, hike. You know, <laughs> you see what I did there? I started a new cycle. Anyhow, it's all you, Jason. Well, Alphonse, thanks for being here with us today. And why don't you tell a little bit of your backstory, how you got into studying this information? Actually, I found a lot of stuff online. I know people have I've, I've heard about the straw man. That's come up a lot. And let me start by saying I, I think the past few shows you guys have done are probably some of the most important shows you've ever done, because this is a topic that affects all of us. You know, regardless of what you believe, what party that you identify with, or what your skin color is, doesn't matter. You know, this affects us all. And sadly, 99.9 percent of us have no clue how to handle ourselves. You know, we're taught the first thing you do is you get a lawyer which is probably the absolute worst thing you could absolute, you can do is to get a lawyer. Uh, and we're taught that only a fool uh, has himself as a client. Well, you should, you should break that down. I know what you're about to say because I had a little preface here, but why is it, you know, we have been taught only, the only foolish man in the courtroom is the one that represents himself. Why don't you tell us what the truth is? Well, the truth is if you walk into court with a lawyer or you take a public defender, Uh, I'm going to talk about two separate topics. I'm going to talk about sovereignty and common law. When you walk into a court of law with a lawyer or a public defender, basically the court sees you as a child, uh, a ward of the court. Uh, You're unable to handle yourself. That's what that's what a court sees. They see the 100 percent opposite of what sovereignty is. And the only thing that's going to free you or protect you is sovereignty and common law. And by you walking into court with a lawyer, you have basically 
uh, abdicated your sovereignty uh, and given up common law. You've agreed to be tried in their court system. So, Alphonse, did you get a situation happen to you that got you looking at this? Did some terrible thing befall you where you had to go to court and you decided to, to go at this yourself? Or was this just something that piqued your interest and you decided to really try and dissect it for yourself? No, I, I've, I've always been political. I, that came from my father. I mean, since I was like 16 years old, I, I've listened to political shows because that's what he did. So I've always been interested in, in I mean, I, I approach things from a conservative point of view. So I always put a lot of stock and faith in, you know, the Constitution. But then, you know, you watch the news and you see things where they break down doors and pull kids out of homes and uh, or they just they freeze people's assets. And you wonder, you sit there and you think, where did we ever sign away authority for them to have this control over us. You know, is this how this system really works? And it, and it just didn't make sense to me. And that's what really led me into to figuring out what's the actual truth? How is this country set up? And what are our rights? What, what can you do to protect yourself as a, as a man or a woman in this country? Awesome. So what did you come across first? Well, you know, I, I've heard the straw man brought up a lot and I've heard it on your show and, I, and I've heard it on other shows. And for the average person to walk into court, and talk about a straw man, straw man without first understanding the principles of sovereignty and common law. The judge in that court is just going to take them apart. Uh, now, you've had some incredibly intelligent people on your show recently that understand sovereignty. They understand common law and they're experienced in the court and they're experienced before judges. Those people could walk into a court and talk about a straw man and handle themselves. But most of the average Joes trying to piece this all this, this stuff all together uh, and much of it's fragmented. You know, you ask 10 different people, you're going to get 10 different answers on what to do. So if you don't have a legal background, this gets muddled for you. And a lot of, for a lot of people, it gets overwhelming. Uh, and if you go into court with a cookie cutter script that a lot of people give you, I'm going to tell you the judge is going to trip you up in a million ways because you're going to be de- declaring your sovereignty in one sentence. And then he's going to start asking you questions and you not knowing the legal language. You're going to trip yourself up and basically make yourself subject to their court system. You're going to give up your sovereignty and your answers, but you don't know the difference. You don't know that there's different languages that are spoken. Uh, you don't know that there's slang. There's the King's English, and then there's the legal language. You were never taught the legal language, and this is where, where you get tripped up. So you know, the straw man thing, it sounds great. And it could be implemented by someone with a great legal background who's got experience for the average Joe to walk in and say, straw man, I'm telling you, the judge is going to smack you down. It's not going to work. And to me, it's not the best way for the average person to defend themselves. There are avenues for us to defend ourselves. To me, that's just not one of them. That's for someone who has a lot of experience. All right. So, Alphonse, the reason that we reached out to you was from an email. I saw your comments coming in on Crow Triple Seven Radio. I've had some trouble with the website, so I was a little bit lagged, but you finally busted an email out to me. Um, That's what got my attention. So what I would like to do here is walk. Let's walk right into a courtroom. What does a person do from the second they walk through the doors? But before we do that, is there any groundwork you think needs to be laid? There were some ideas about God, man, you know, the order of things and other things expressed in the email. So let me ask you, do you want to outline anything before we jump straight into a very concise breakdown of what should a person, how should they conduct themselves when they have to go walk through that door and stand tall before the magistrate? Sure. Listen, I'm going to give you a concise thing of what to do when when you walk into a court. But I think we do need a little bit of background. And let's start. The main thing is, like I said, there are three different languages. There's slang that's spoken. There's King's English that you and I speak back and forth to each other. But then there's the legal language. And when people go into court, they don't understand that they're no longer speaking the King's English, meaning they're now speaking a legal language. And in King's English, you know, you and I would probably agree that the word person and people mean the same thing. But in a court of law, they're totally opposite things, what a person is and and what people are. You know, and if you read Black's Dictionary of of what a person is, uh, they consider like companies and corporations, uh, partnerships, uh, organizations as people. I I mean, as persons. So you and I would never describe, you know, an organization as a person. Uh, So right off the bat, the average person doesn't know they're using King's English terms. They don't realize that they're, they're now in a court of law with whole different legal terms. And the main thing is when you walk into a court, what I would tell you is you should never walk into the court as a defendant. 
So if something happens to you and you get you know get arrested, and you get a mailing to you, so you have an affidavit you have to show up to on this date. The first thing you should do is you go file a counterclaim, and you're going to question their jurisdiction in that counterclaim. Can you be very specific? It's one thing to say to file a counterclaim, but be very specific. Tell us exactly what that means and how you do it, please. Basically, a counterclaim is just a one-page sheet. I mean, I could provide one for you to, to give to people, or, or I could provide links to, to, counter, to counterclaims. They're very simple. It's just like a heading, and it's really just a paragraph, a short little paragraph. And basically, all you're doing is when you file a counterclaim and you question jurisdiction, everything stops. Their action against you, their that arraignment process stops until jurisdiction can be can be proven. And and it's not your it's not your place to prove that they don't have jurisdiction over you. It's now their place to prove that they do have jurisdiction over you. Let me see if I've got this straight. You're walking into a courtroom that has some kind of an Italian or Latin moniker attached to it, and it can only exist that jurisdiction until it is challenged. Is that correct? Right. You've had some guests on there to talk about these fake, you know, low level courts. What they're called is they're called uh, the technical term is Nise, N-I-S-A, Prius, like the car, Prius courts. And all that fancy term means is courts that are allowed to exist without objection. So that means if you walk into a, an arraignment as the defendant, you haven't filed a counterclaim, you just got the paperwork and you showed up for your arraignment as a, as a defendant and they ask you to plea guilty, not guilty, no contest. As soon as you make a plea, you have forfeited your sovereignty. You have now agreed to participate in that Nice Prius court, that fake made court that they that they have. Uh, you have you have abdicated your sovereignty. That's the only reason that there's an arraignment hearing is for you to give up your sovereignty. So wait a minute. In the arraignment, if you do go into the arraignment and you do make a plea, you've become two things for certain, if I'm not mistaken here. A citizen, which is basically a slave and the defendant, which you don't want to be. So let me ask you, the counterclaim reverses the idea that you're a defendant. What does the counterclaim do and where do you file it? It's the one page sheet you fill out. And what you'll do is you'll fill it out. Basically, it's, it's a one sentence. Like I would say in my counterclaim would be just this one sentence. It would say, I, Alfonso Fagiola of Pennsylvania, being one of the people, comma. So now I'm, I'm and I'm going to go back to what the people means. In this court of record is my next little sentence. And by that, those words alone, what I've just did is I've now turned this into a common law court. This Nisei Prius fake court that they have me in, I've now turned it into a common law court with that. Right, with that. And then I put comma, claim that the state of Pennsylvania has grossly overstepped their jurisdiction in this matter. Boom. And that's it. It stops. So by the time... This hits that, that by the time I walk in for that arraignment, there's already a counterclaim filed against that. Everything must stop until jurisdiction is established. And it, like I said, it is not my responsibility to prove that they don't have jurisdiction over me. It's their responsibility to prove that they do have jurisdiction over me. And that's really, that's an impossible task for them. As you know, I, I can go into a little further later on why that is, uh, you know, what a court of record is. Okay, so something I got into in the last episode was the difference between the definition of a person, and, and you said that earlier. That's exactly right. Under the law, a person is not people. One is basically the corporate identity, if I understand it correctly, and that's where this whole straw man thing comes in. They're trying the straw man, I think, if I understand this correctly, they're trying the corporate identity, and what you're doing by challenging this jurisdiction is, I'm not giving you permission to go after me to my corporate identity. I'm saying you have no jurisdiction over me, the living, breathing man. Is, am I getting this correct? You're actually complicating it more than it really needs to be. Here's all you need to know. When you're in a court, when you show up in an arraignment, you're at, at what they call a Nice Prius court. It's one of their courts. The only court of record it can be a common law court, and a court of record is a very important thing. I'm going to go over what that entails, what a court of record is, and, and why it's so important to you. But when you show up at, at that arraignment, you're, you're basically in their court system, okay, at that point. If you don't file a counterclaim, you're the defendant. You're in their court. And what they want to do, the only purpose for an arraignment is for you to issue a plea or to walk in with an attorney to show that you're not sovereign. As soon as you issue a plea, you, you have contracted 
to participate in that court system. You have you have contracted to participate in that court system and to forgo what you have available to you, common law, which is where your power and your safety really lies in a common law court, not a fake court over there. So that's the only person reason for an arraignment process. So it has really nothing to do with a straw man that they're charging. They're just getting you. They just want you to advocate your sovereignty. They want you to give away your sovereignty to them and agree to be tried in their court system. That's what a plea is for. That's the only thing a plea is for. Well, what I mean is the straw man is the same thing as the citizen, the corporate identity. That's who their court would be trying. You're saying, no, I'm not giving you jurisdiction. I am a sovereign person. I not even, shouldn't even use the term person. I'm a sovereign, one of the people, not a citizen. Therefore, you do not have jurisdiction over me. Correct. Uh, you could look at, like I said, the straw man, as, as, as you noted there. Basically, the corporate entity and the straw man, they're, they're one and the same thing. But all they care about is you're going to abdicate your sovereignty. You have these natural rights that, that you've had. The founders set this country up this way, that you can really only be tried in a common court of law. Uh, for you to be tried, for someone to come after you for something, there must be a victim. You had to have injured somebody in some way. And they must step forward and, and uh, testify or, or uh, swear an oath before God that you have hurt them in some way, and they must be able to prove damages that you've hurt them in some way. That's the only way you could be tried, uh, unless you abdicate that and agree to be tried in their court system. So when you show up and, and you follow their rules mm -hmm. and you issue a plea, you have given up your sovereignty to them. You, you have contracted with them to give up your sovereignty and agree to be tried in their court system. And you are not you're done at that point. You are not going to go anywhere at, at that point. So we should address, you know, when I was in the Marine Corps, there was like this hierarchy, this idea of God, core country, you know, the order of things in which they were respected or what came first. Does the court have a, a hierarchy like that of how it views, say, God, a man, the law, these types of ideas? Yeah, actually, it's funny when you when you they talk about God and they've tried to be, you know, take God out of the school system and kill God with ridiculous theories like, you know, the Big Bang Theory and, and evolution, because only God can grant you uh, natural rights. Uh, if they can kill the idea of a God, then your rights can only come from man. And that's what they've been trying to instill in, in kids and in culture and in media. They want to drill that in your head that there is no God, that your rights are coming from the government. The government grants you rights. But isn't it in their hierarchy? Isn't God listed in the hierarchy of who the who the you know, if you were going to say what's on top of the court's mind in a hierarchy, where does God land? Where does man land? God is number one. Man is number two. Government is number three. And actually, if I look at the preamble of just the Pennsylvania Constitution, here's how it starts off. We, the people of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, grateful to almighty God for the blessings of civil and religious liberty and humbly invoking his guidance, do our deign and establish this Constitution. So right there, they're placing God at the top. OK, man is second when he's born. And this is where the preamble to the Constitution comes along. People, like if you ask a lawyer, what does the preamble mean in the Constitution? They'll say, oh, it's just some flowery language. It means nothing. It's, it has no bearing. The preamble of the Constitution is everything. It's where all of your rights come from. It's where all of your rights are protected. So it all starts with the preamble of the Constitution. It says, we the people of the United States, okay? And it goes through saying what they're doing. They're setting up this government, blah, blah. But the key phrases down at the bottom are, do ordain and establish the Constitution of the United States of America. So ordain means to create. Establish means to set up. So the people were sovereign before they set up the Constitution. Nowhere in the preamble have they given away their, their sovereignty. They were sovereign before they set it up. They're sovereign after they set it up. And if you notice what they do is they differentiate between you know, the United States, we the people of the United States, and down at the bottom, it says this Constitution for the United States of America, because the United States of America is a company. It's a fiduciary trust. That's why it occupies a, a 10 square mile block in the, the District of Columbia. It's not part of the states. It's a separate entity. Trump is the president of a company. You know, rooting for Trump in a way is sort of like rooting for Tim Cook from Apple or the CEO of GE. They're a separate company and they really should have no effect on your life unless you don't have enough knowledge and, and you decide to, to abdicate and call yourself a citizen, which the 14th Amendment 
automatically would turn you into basically a slave of the state. The state controls you if you're a citizen. The state does not control the people. The people are the people that set up the U.S. Constitution. Now, something that jumped out at me when you were going through the hierarchy, it sounds like God is for the people, but God is not for the person. Yeah, I mean, really, for you to actually participate and in, in, in call yourself a citizen and make this the, the government your, your God in a way, uh, you know, you're, you're, a, you're a servant to the government if you're a citizen. That really goes against God's laws and what God preaches. You know, God gave you natural born rights. And really, your natural born rights mean anything you define that they are. You have sovereignty. You can make any rights you want as long as your rights don't interfere with my sovereignty. If your sovereignty doesn't bother my sovereignty, you're free to do anything you want to do. That's your natural born right. That's how this government was set up. That's that's how our country was set up. So you're free to do anything you want as long as you don't interfere with me, as long as you don't injure me in any way. Well, kind of what I was getting at is they're taking God out of all these systems and all that because that is going under their Saturnian jurisdiction stuff as opposed yes. to the individual, the free person, the sovereign. That's what I was getting at. No, you're, you're 100% right. You're 100% right. If you take God out of the equation, then man gives you your rights. Government gives you your rights. <clears throat> Is there any way we can talk about it? There's going to be a lot of people listening that don't claim a religion. So what I want to get here is when we're saying God, what we're saying, you know, basically what we could equate it with is anyone who's listened to the show, I say over and over, there is no lie in nature. That is what we are talking about. Creation, right? Natural law. That's right. Natural law. It is what it is. So don't mix religiosity into what we're saying here, because if you do mix religiosity into it, you're missing the boat. And I will point out again, religions are corporations, man, and they're giving their power from another corporation called a government. But anyhow, sorry to have stepped on you there, Alphonse. Go ahead, man. Bro, well, you're 100 percent right. I'm probably the most un unreligious person you'll ever meet. OK, the only time you'll find me in church is at a wedding or a funeral. Uh, so this, when I mention God, I'm not talking in reference to religions. Rel you're right. Religions are nothing but corporations. And really, religions, to me, the main goal of religion is to actually pull people away from God because they tell you how to think and what to think. And that's not how God made you. God made you a, a free man, a free, a, a free individual to think for yourself. That's how he created you. And now you're participating in this group, this religion, this group think, and you're going along with how they tell you to think, what to think, what you should do, what you shouldn't do. And to me, that's probably the most ungodly thing you can do. So when I speak of God, I'm not being religious about this. I'm just like you were saying, talking from a creator standpoint, nature standpoint. You know, you, you were put here by something or, you know, I don't think we just sprung out of a big bang and something crawled out of the ocean and turned to a monkey and billions of years later it turned to us. I, that's absurd. Something put us here. Now, you could have any term you want for it. So when I refer to God, I'm referring to that entity, whatever it is that that placed us here. Okay, I think this was a critical point to make because what we're laying down here is for every single living, breathing man or woman to investigate. I don't care what religion you may have been brought up in or one that you've chose to follow yourself. What we are laying down here is something that each of us can investigate to find out if there's value here. But anyhow, I kind of feel like we tracked you off as we were getting into the 14th Amendment. Is that true? Is there something more we need to cover on the 14th Amendment, or should we move on? No, listen, uh, you're 100% right. Just the way you phrased it, you're 100% right. But yeah, I do want to address the 14th Amendment here. What people don't realize is the 14th Amendment, there's two stipulations in the 14th Amendment. It's that all persons born or naturalized in the United States— and subject to the jurisdiction thereof. So in effect, what the 14th Amendment really did is it took black people from private slavery and put them into public slavery. And along with that, it took all of us with them and put us into public slavery because it turned, it turned us into citizens. Now, even though you and I are born in the United States, we don't have to be subject to its jurisdiction. That's our right as a, a natural right as a sovereign man. Uh, okay, I was born in the U.S. I, I'm not subject to your jurisdiction. Uh, I'm separating myself from your jurisdiction. So I'm not a citizen. And you should never define yourself as a citizen. You should define yourself as one of the people. You know, if I'm from the state of Pennsylvania, I'm one of the people of Pennsylvania. Or if, uh, if I'm talking about my country, uh, I'm one of the people of the United States. I'm not one of the people of the United States of America. That's a company. 
I'm one of the people of the United States. Uh, I'm sovereign. And if they ask you, what are you making reference to when you say you're one of the people? Say, just as it's spelled out in the preamble to the Constitution, we the people— I'm sorry. I just want to make a distinction here. You've been saying that the if you say USA, what you mean is United States of America. What you're saying is United States, including America, is a corporation. Is that backwards? Because what we've heard in other cases is that it's actually the United States that is the corporation and the United States of America preceded that corporation. So I think we need to make a distinction here. What's your view? No, the United States of America is the corporation, the company they set up. When they reference United States in the preamble, all they're making reference to is the states working together. That's all they're making reference to is the states working together. They're not making they're not referencing a corporate entity. They are referencing a corporate entity when they say created for the United States of America. So to me, that is a distinction. Listen, you give no sovereignty away when you say I'm one of the people of the United States. So the reason I brought that up is if the, if what you have just said is correct, then I need to be corrected because I've pointed out time and again that it's U.S. Marines, U.S. Navy pointing to it as a corporate entity. If what you have just laid down is correct, then I have been, in fact, wrong many, many times claiming that these military endeavors are, in fact, working for the corporation. To me, they're corporate entities, the United States Navy, United States Army. They're corporate entities that work for the United States of America. That's really what, that's where they get their funding from the United States of America. Okay. Now they get it through tax dollars, but but they're they're actually, they're, they're companies, the United States Army, the United States Navy, they're companies. When they reference, remember your rights are coming from the, the, the preamble. Basically what that's doing is that's establishing sovereignty. That's the people saying, hey, listen, we the people of the United States are creating this constitution. And the only purpose of a constitution, why they created it is to put a fence around the government to protect themselves so that they can stay outside of that fence. And what's got twisted with people that they don't understand is people have gotten inside that fence and now they think they derive their rights from the Constitution and they think they derive their rights from the Bill of Rights. How many times you'll hear somebody say, the Second Amendment gives me the right to own a gun. No, the Second Amendment doesn't give you the right to own a gun. The government gave you that right. Just your God-given right of being born natural rights, you can own a gun. The government doesn't give you that right. God gives you that right. Not not a government. Good point. It sounds like there's a line of the sand that was drawn. So when the original Constitution was set up, back with the Founding Fathers and all that, this citizen crap was not established yet. The 14th Amendment is when everything got reshuffled. That was the line in the sand where all of a sudden they started the corporate jurisdiction sort of thing. That's the whole Matrix thing where you were born into bondage. They basically turned everybody into a citizen automatically. And they've dumbed you down to a point where they don't teach you about sovereignty. So what do they teach you in school? How to be a good citizen. You know, you're taught about 50 years ago, they used to teach teach civics classes that taught you about your rights, your natural rights. Then it turned into social studies and it turned into a political science. Now they're teaching you about government and how government works. And they've, they've removed teaching you about your natural rights. So they've turned you into a citizen. They've made you think that that's a proud thing to be. I'm a proud United States citizen or United States. No, you, 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 when you define yourself like that, you're defining yourself as a slave, as is noted in the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment is making the government sovereign to you. They're, 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 taking, uh, they're taking control over the citizen. So the way that chain goes is man created the government. The man owns the government. The government created the citizen in the 14th Amendment. The government owns the citizen, according to the 14th Amendment. You and I, if we define ourselves as sovereign, we don't need to be subject to the jurisdiction of whatever, the state or or, or the, the country. That's our right to not be subject to that. That's what natural law is, and that's where the common law courts are. That's why you have that right in the common law courts. So let's read this for a moment. I just pulled up the 14th Amendment. All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, 
nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. So, that was adopted on July 9th, 1868. So at that point, there's your line in the sand, correct? Yeah, and how big of a lie is a lot of that? Uh, shall not deprive any person of life, liberty, or pro property. My God, you watch the news every night, you'll see con people constantly deprived of life, liberty, and property. I would point out that maybe if you scrutinize that sentence, you know, those two sentences, it breaks in half. At first, they're talking about citizens of the United States. The people at the end, the life, liberty and property that can't be infringed or deprived is a person. So I think there's a real distinction there. Am I wrong? The main thing that you have to grasp is when you have sovereignty, you can never give sovereignty away. OK, you can only consent to participate in something. So that's what that line's real important for when it says subject to the jurisdiction thereof. Well, you have the right as a natural born man not to be subject to the jurisdiction. So you don't have to, by you doing that, you separate yourself from their, their laws, their ordinances, their statutes. You're outside of that. You step outside of that in the common law. Does that make sense? It does. Um, so is this a good place? Have we done enough kind of explanation up front to start to get into the point when a person is going to have to make the decision, am I going to walk into this Neus Preci or Precess court and be a defendant or am I not? Is this a good place for us to start at the very beginning and concisely begin to break that down? Or is there more that we need to cover before we pick that up? No, that, that's the main thing, the chain of command, basically, that, that the people created the government, they foreown the government, the government created the citizen, they foreown the citizen. That's that's the main thing you have to keep in your mind. You have to understand that that gives you your sovereignty. That puts you above the government. Uh, the master that created the slave, which is the, the government, the slave can never control the master. And that's the basis of, of common law and, and of natural rights. OK, so let's pick up. We're about to walk through the doors of that uh, infamous little court system we got going on there. And we're going to have to stand tall before the magistrate. So let's reiterate what does the individual, the living human, the living man or woman do to remove themselves from the Prius, from the, I can't even say the word, Nisi, Prius. <laughs> yeah, Nisi Prius court? How do they click it over to common law, be very specific, and how do they remove themselves from being titled as defendant? All right, you never want to go into anything as the defendant. Uh, you get arrested, and like I said, and you get something mailed to you that you have an arraignment coming up that you have to show up to on this date. Uh, you never want to be the defendant. When you're the defendant, you immediately convert yourself to the plaintiff by filing a, a counterclaim, like which I said is a one-page sheet that you'll fill out. That you, there's, you could find a million sites where there's counterclaims. They're easy to find, and I'll be happy to provide documents, counterclaims to people. It's really not complicated to, to fill out. Who do you file that with, Alphonse? Right. With right. the county, with the clerk of courts. So wait a minute. Let's stop right there for a second. You literally walk into the doors, getting ready to stand in front of the magistrate. You have this document in your hand. When you walk up there, the bailiff, by law, has to accept that document. Is that correct? Yes, but no. The day after you receive that that notice of a, a, an arraignment, you go down and you file your counterclaim immediately. You right. Your arraignment hearing might be 30 days away. Got you're going to file. You're going to file right away. You want to get that counterclaim in as quick as possible. You want to convert yourself to the plaintiff as quick as possible. You, you don't want to do it right at the time of the court hearing. That's the worst time you could probably do it. And what does the clerk of court do then? Like you file that and they do what? In a way, they're keeping the court record, all the papers of the trial. The trial actually exists only on paper. People think the trial happens from the speaking, the, the, the talking in the court. It's not. Uh, the trial actually happens in the paperwork. And the only thing you're hearing in, in, in court are fights over certain things that shouldn't be admissible and not be admissible. They're, they're not really trying the case. The case has already been put into your, your claim that you filed. Uh, so that's the court of records keeps that, that main record. That's the record that if you have to appeal this to an appellate court, that's the record that goes to the appellate court. And the appellate court's just going to look at the record, the actual record, what was done, what was said, and what, what action was determined. That's how they make their decision. That's what the clerk does. So when you hand that in, do they give you something in return, like a, a paper of some sort saying that, OK, you've done this? Yeah, there's there is a thing uh, you have to basically you get it notarized and uh, you send a copy to the now counter defendant. There is a little process you go through. It's, it's not long, though. It's basically just making a couple copies and sending it to a couple people. Is it the prosecutor and all that? The, yeah, they did. Well, they're now the prosecutor will now be the, the, the co-defendant. Right. Because you filed a counterclaim. You're not a plaintiff. 
So yeah, he, he would get a copy of it too. So, but the, the main thing you need to know is when you do that, all you're going for is by you just stating I Alfonso Fagiola of being one of the people of Pennsylvania in this court of record claim the state of Pennsylvania has overstepped their jurisdiction. Boom. Okay. Everything comes to a halt now once that claim's filed. Nothing can proceed until jurisdiction is proven that they have jurisdiction over you. Now, the judge may try and move you off a of jurisdiction. He may say, hey, Mr. Crow, you know, listen, we'll get back to you on jurisdiction, but, but let's proceed. You do not let them move forward. Technically, this is now your court. This counterclaim has now turned this into your court. You do not proceed because by letting him proceed, you're showing you don't have sovereignty and that you don't understand the process or your rights. So in a way, a lot a judge will try and trick a lot of people and try and move them. I've heard him, I've seen him say it in court to people where, listen, we'll get back to you on, on the uh, jurisdiction thing. No, you never let a judge off the jurisdiction. You hold them there. Nothing can proceed. Basically, their their claim was that was filed against you that brought you in for that arraignment. You've now frozen that claim. That counterclaim freezes that until they can establish that they have jurisdiction over you. It's a brick wall. Until they, fit, they prove they have jurisdiction over you, they can't do nothing to you. Alphonse, you're a member of Crow 777 Radio, right? Uh, yeah, I just found you, yeah. Can you provide links to some of these things so that people can see examples of not only the document, but where it has to be filed and how that process works? When we post the show, can you go in the forum under this episode to give people a path to travel? Happily. So when you file and they give you the whatever paperwork back, the day of the actual hearing and you're walking in, you've got that paperwork with you. I'm trying to get an exact step-by-step -step thing here. Are you walking up to the bench? Are you handing it to the bailiff? Like, how does all this go down? Because they're going to do their usual nonsense of are you so-and-so and all that nonsense. So, Well, basically what you've done is when, when you filed a counterclaim and you've, you've noted that it's now a court of record, only a common law court can be a court of record. And there's five main stipulations of what a court of record must have. The main thing for you is you have now turned the judge from the tribunal into the magistrate. And all a magistrate is is an administrator. He's now an administrator. You being the plaintiff are now the tribunal. In effect, you are now the judge, technically. But listen, he's he's going to run the court the way he, he he wants to run it. So you all you're going to do is you're going to stick on jurisdiction. You're not going to move off jurisdiction. You need to say nothing more. It's in your it's in your filing. Only thing he could ask you about is any anything he's not clear of on what your your filing is. You know, a, a clarification. If he asks you anything different than what is in your filing, you shut your mouth. You don't need to speak. The papers speak for you. That's your protection. The, the papers speak for you. If he tries to run over you and railroad you, all you do is you object to it. Your Honor, I object. Mr. Fadjol, why do you object? It's not my wish, Your Honor. Well, Mr. Fadjol, that's not good enough to say it's not your wish. I understand. But do, noted for the court, Your Honor, I do object. So all you're doing is creating a court record, basically, that I, object, I objected to this point. I objected to that point because technically, since I counterclaimed, I'm now the tribunal. I'm technically now the judge. This is technically my hearing. Don't think you're going to go in there and just run the hearing, though. It's not going to work like that. But you do have powers from from basically being in that position, the position of the tribunal. All you're doing is you're, you're objecting to create a court of record. And what you should do is have a notepad right at your desk. And don't, don't rely on a court reporter to grab everything, to catch everything. Anything you object to, you just write down what you objected to. And what the what the judge, you know, what what is what he does, uh, what he said, don't let them rush you. You could take as much time as you want writing your objection down. Don't let them try and intimidate you and rush you through. Your Honor, let me make this note first, and and then I'll happily speak with you. You know, and you take your time and, and you get your objection down, because what you're later going to do is all those things you objected to when this hearing is done, and he smacks the gavel down and you walk out. You're going to go right to your computer and you're going to issue orders that overturn everything he just did. That's your right as the tribunal. Well, what I was getting at, when you first walk in and they ask you, are you Alphonse Fagioli, are you acknowledging that to begin with? You have no loss. You're not, you, you sacrifice no sovereignty saying I'm Alphonse Fagioli. You do not attach yourself to the straw man. Yeah, it doesn't matter. You're allowed to call yourself whatever you want. Yeah, I'm Alphonse Fagioli. You're allowed to say that. And what I think they're going to do when you when you walk in, I think they're going to try and still push you through their process. They're going to see how sharp you are if you understand what's going on. 
because like I said, they may say, hey, uh, Mr. Lindgren, you know what? We're get, we'll get back to you on this jurisdiction thing. Let's move ahead to this. You don't move anywhere. But, but wait a minute here. If everything that we've walked up through here is correct, what's happened when you filed and quit being the defendant? In fact, you became the tribunal in a court of record, which is a common law court. What that implies is when you walk back into that court of law, and I'm assuming the word tribunal means three, which means you are now the judge, there is a clerk, and then whatever the hell you call the judge now, which I guess would be the defendant, um, there has to be a three there somewhere. But my point is this. If, in fact, that is now a common law court, it doesn't matter if he's holding a piece of paper in all capital letters with a straw man identity on it, right? Because now it's a common law court of record. You're dealing with the naturally born man or woman. Is that correct? Exactly. Makes no difference. He's now in a common law court, and there are five principles to, to a court of record. When you filed that claim and you said, I, Alfonso Fagiola, being one of the people of Pennsylvania, in this court of record, just that word, those words you used, you have established a common law court at that point. And here are the five principles of a common law court and how, why they're powerful for you. Generally, it has to have a seal. It has to have a seal of some sort. OK, a seal is used. It's a stamp that's used in in lieu of consideration, because remember, everything's a contract. And in a contract, you need to have consideration. So that's what stamps are for. They you know, they're like in lieu of money. They act as consideration. That's what a stamp's for. You don't have to have a stamp. That's the one tenet of a court of record that you don't have to have. But it's smart to do and it's smart to have. Number two tenet of a court of record, the power to fine or imprison for contempt this means judges and officers of the court. So anybody violating your rights is now in legal and financial jeopardy. They, they have lost any immunity they have that they thought they have in their Nisei Prius court. They're now in a common law court. They're now subject to legal and financial problems. Number three, it keeps a record of the proceedings. You know, and basically all a record is, is what was pr proposed and what was the outcome of the proposal. That's all a record is. It's no more complicated than that. Number four tenet, the court proceeds according to common law, which means here's the great part, guys, not laws, statutes or codes or penal codes. They're not allowed in common law. So basically what they're going to try, basically go after you, the state of Pennsylvania, is on a statute that they have. Mr. Fadjol violated statute 18 dash whatever, whatever. Well, when I turn it into a common court of law, they now can't bring their statutes over. Their statutes don't apply in a common law court of record. Game over. Well, Bill. They can't use statutes. And number five, the tribunal is independent of the magistrate, which means this means the judge becomes the magistrate. And what a magistrate is, is just an administrator. He's now an administrator of the court. You're now the plaintiff. You now become the tribunal, in effect, the judge. Technically, it's now your court. You're technically in control of the court. But like I said, no judge, they're not going to just bow down to you and the way you show your, your sovereignty by being in the tribunal is in the things you can do afterwards where when you walk out of that hearing, if, if, he, if he tries to railroad you and not listen to what you have to say, you could overturn his orders. Each one of his orders you could file to overturn on another piece of paper. You would fill that out. It's the same kind. It's another one page sheet. You would take that, take it down to the clerk again. You file it with the clerk. <laughs> the stipulations you have to file it with, uh, which are basically, I think a copy has to be sent to, to this person, a copy to that person. It's not complicated. It's just a procedural thing. But you file that with the, the clerk, and now you have technically overturned all his orders. And you could do things such as make a ruling in there that, that he can no longer issue any more orders in this court. But he's still hung up. They, they cannot move anywhere with you until they establish jurisdiction. That's the power of, a, of a, when you say a, a court of record. That, that they're, they're the powers of the court of record. They can't use their statutes against you, and you now take the judge from, a, from being a tribunal, the judge, and you turn him into a, an administrator. You take his power away from him, basically. Right. But right from the get-go, when you filed the original jurisdiction with the clerk of courts, I'm going to assume that they've informed the prosecutor, so they know right off the bat when you're walking in the door for the actual court date what you're going to at least attempt to do. Would that be correct? Yes. I mean, they should. You filed a counterclaim. You've told them exactly what you're going to do. You're, you're questioning jurisdiction. They know right what you're going to do. But that doesn't mean that they have to follow it. What that means is they may get you in court, Jason, and, and try and walk you past jurisdiction. Mr. Lindgren, we'll, we'll get back to you on jurisdiction. Let's proceed for now. And if you go along with that, 
you're giving your sovereignty away. You're, you're letting an administrator take control of your court. You're no longer the sovereign, basically, by doing that. You're abdicating power to the administrator, to the magistrate. Well, at what point do you actually say anything? Like, I'm, I'm assuming this is very early on. They say, are you Jason Lindgren? And I say, yes. What is it you actually say at that point? Let's, let's be really clear about that. When you're in court, the less you talk, the better. Remember, I said, all your, the case is determined in the paperwork. All that you need to know is, all they need to know is, you've put it in the paperwork. Now, the only reason that they bring you in is would be to ask you a question to clarify something, but it has to pertain to what your, your counterclaim is, the, the jurisdiction thing. If they go off asking you other questions, which they may do to try and get you off, you know, try and move you off the, the point and, and show that you're not in control of the court, you don't go along with it. You say, yeah, yeah, my name's Jason Lindgren. Yeah, that's it. You don't you don't expand on anything. Uh, and if they try and any if they try and move forward with stuff and you know that they have before the court, they have a counterclaim where you're, you're challenging jurisdiction and that by law, by their constitutional law, nothing can move until they establish jurisdiction against you. So anything he then does from there, if he's not going to follow procedures, you just object to. And listen, don't get in a fight with him. Don't get in a fight with a judge. They got the guns. They got the force. You're not going to win in a court. You're not going to fight a judge in court and win. You don't care. You don't care to win in court. You're not worried about that. All, all, you're, all you need to know is you're the tribunal. This is technically now your hearing. OK, he could do whatever he wants and you just object to he does something you don't like. Uh, well, Mr. Lingram, we're going to come back for jurisdiction. We're going to move on to this. I object, Your Honor. What do you do? Why do you object to Mr. Lingram? Well, it's not my wish. Well, that's not good enough reason, Mr. Lingram. For the record, I want it noted that this is not my wish. So now the court reporters got that. It's now in it's now in the record. It's part of the record that you have objected to this because technically you're the judge. You now have an administrator that is now overriding you, trying to override you. He's overstepping his authority. He's overstepping his jurisdiction. You're just creating a court of record that now you can, like I said, later leave that hearing and issue orders to overturn everything he did. You can overturn because that's your right as the tribunal. So <clears throat> you just you just. Whatever he wants to ask you, you can answer. It ha if it has anything to do with what is not on your sheet, which is jurisdiction, you shut your mouth, Jason. You're under no obligation to speak in court. You could say, Your Honor, everything I have to say is in my, my uh, counterclaim there. Yeah, that's what I was getting at. When they start asking you questions, are you supposed to just say, we have not discussed the jurisdiction yet? Yeah, you're under no obligation to speak. You just say, Your Honor, everything I have to say is in my counterclaim. He knows what you're there for. He knows your question in jurisdiction. You don't need to explain yourself again. You've put it in. You put it in writing. You've made it part of their court record. You don't need to talk anymore. You shut your mouth. The more you speak, the worse it could be for you. If he takes you off into some tangent, asking you questions that are totally off the subject of jurisdiction, he's going to get you in trouble. You're going to get yourself in trouble. So you don't need to move from there. So if he wants to ask you anything that doesn't. You know, if he wants to ask you about a spelling or something that you put in there, you know, that's fine. That pertains to your what you claimed. But if he starts asking you questions that have nothing to do with your counterclaim, which is jurisdiction, you shut your mouth. Your Honor, everything is in my claim. You know, read my, read my paper there, Your Honor. You stay on point. You don't speak. Will they railroad you, though, and just keep going right over it? ignoring it basically and if they do do you have a, a suit against them if they just proceed as normal even if you don't say anything and say pass a judgment on you and want to haul you off somewhere is this all at this point illegal and you could literally sue the living snot out of them for it yeah that's when when you when i read the five tenets of a court of record it, it makes the officers of the court now financially and legally liable. They don't have immunity. The judge doesn't have immunity anymore because he's not in a Nisei Prius court anymore. He's not in a fake court anymore. He's now in a common law court where officers have a financial and legal liability in, in a common law court. So yeah, if he wants to railroad you, listen, in a court, in, in the court, you can't do nothing about it, Jason. He's gonna, he's gonna run over you. But all you care is anything he does, you object to. You're just creating a record. Your Honor, I object to that. Why do you object, Mr. Lindgren? It's not my wish, Your Honor. Yeah, and you could say just that. You've, you're now on record to objecting to what he did. Because if he wants to keep railroading you, he, he's going to figure out at a certain point, probably when you overturn all his orders, when you go home and overturn all his orders, he's going to figure out that what he's doing, he knows is illegal, that he don't have authority. He's the, he's the, he's the magistrate in this hearing now. He's, he's no longer the, the tribunal. So what he's doing is illegal. The danger comes for him is, 
if he wants to railroad you through and whatever, throw you in jail or whatever, this is eventually going to go to an appellate court. And the appellate court will overturn him for jurisdiction. And two things can happen. By him acting like that, he does open himself up to legal liability uh, and financial liability, which means you can go after his house, his savings. Uh, you can have him disbarred. Uh, yeah, he's in legal liability. That's the power of a common law court. He has immunity over there in the Nisei Prius court, pretty much immunity. But when you have him over in a common law court, he's at peril. He's, he's, he's supposed to follow guidelines over there. Not that he always will. And that's the only, the only thing you could do with a, with a rogue judge is <clears throat> just object. All you're doing is creating a record so that you have something to go back to. That's all you're doing. So we're getting close to the top of the hour here. So we've got to be pretty succinct before we take a break and get come back to uh, to cover actually a hell of a lot more ground here. But, you know, as you break down all the things we've said, if they're true and correct, first of all, every judge up there that you will ever meet has to understand the difference between the two courts, what a common law court is and the court that they're trying to implement. Um, if that is correct, if I am hearing and understanding everything that's been said and everything that's said is correct, that judge actually, by the system that's been built up, has a vested interest in preventing you from ever getting to common law status, from clicking over from defendant, because if that happens, he's no longer immune. So it's almost like the protection of the fictitious system, if all this is correct, is almost built in right there. If that judge is faced with someone who knows their rights, comes in, submits the paperwork they need to, quits being the defendant, becomes the tribunal or the judge, takes all the amnesty that the people in that court have, and now they are liable for things, that alone is enough incentive for them to do everything in their power to try to prevent an individual from gaining back their rights to get to a common law court situation. I mean, what do you think? Exactly. I mean, really, this is why the founders set this up to it this way. They were their fear was that they were going to have a, an out of control government. And this is the only way that they could control the government was with the common law and to put the common law. <clears throat> the common law is above the government. Uh, and it's actually stated in the Seventh Amendment, where basically the Seventh Amendment says that any common law court decision cannot be overturned by a court, not even the Supreme Court. Not even the Supreme Court can overturn a common law court ruling. Alfonso, hold that thought. We're going to keep the Seventh Amendment in mind. Uh, we are out of time. What we're going to do is we're going to come back and pick up right where we've left off. We are going to leave as much information as we can under this episode for people to go investigate and try to verify and authenticate the things that have been said here. And I'm telling every dang one of you listening, it is your responsibility to do that. If you feel like you want to be a sovereign citizen in this world, then there's some responsibility there. And understanding what is true and correct is part of that responsibility. Responsibility. At the posting of this episode, there will be 113 free episodes of content on Crow777radio.com. No login is necessary. I hope to see you all over at Crow777radio.com for hour two. There it is, man. Cheers.